Jesus or something else. And it comes from my own personal journey and walk through religion, Christianity, and finally oneness with God. And I take my thoughts from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God, it says, and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. The first time that that verse came to my notice was about 25 years ago, our family was speaking in Italy. And we wanted to go up in the northern Italy into the mountains there that border Switzerland into the Alps where the Waldensians lived and where they fled there because they were being persecuted for their faith. They were considered in the Bible, the church in the wilderness, and they had a pure faith. And I wanted to go and study their faith after we were speaking there. So we were up there, and when we walked into a little chapel they had up there, way up in the mountains, that verse was right over the archway of the church. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So my thoughts are being taken from my journey of those 25 years since then, what I've learned in my journey. And I pray that you can learn from what I've learned, what's taken me 25 years. Hopefully we can condense that and you can learn in a very short period of time what's taken me decades to learn. And that is this, our distinction should not lie in the adherence to some special creed, Christian culture, or religious forms. That's where my distinction at first, my first journey in Christianity lied in that factor. Our distinction should lie in the dynamic of Christ's life within us, within Jim Holmberger, within my daily life. And it should lie within our marriages, and it should lie within our families. All those around us should understand that it is Christ in us who determines our deportment and our distinctiveness. We're no longer our own. We are his. We belong to God and God alone. That's Colossians 2.10. You are complete in him, it says. Our conduct, our conversation, our character is to be a living witness that he has complete empowerment in our lives. So when people meet me, they know that I'm filtering things through God. They know that I have a living, abiding experience in and through Jesus Christ. They know they can tell by my looking in my eyes, by looking at my department, by looking at my, my children who are adults now, by looking at my marriage that I'm in love. I have a well-ordered, well-disciplined family because I'm not of the religion I belong to, but because God and I are one in and through Jesus Christ. This should be the badge that we point to, oneness with our God. The death of the day-to-day -day reality of this experience has been the downfall of the church of today. It is its fatal deficiency, and it's in every denomination. I've had the privilege to speak to over 13 denominations, and I find it every place I go, in every country, and in every state in the United States. Jesus longs for us to experience life as he lived it, oneness with his Father. We have made the gospel something other than a daily, hourly living experience in and through Jesus Christ. And that saddens God not just me, it makes them weep and cry. The gospel has become something else other than this. The gospel isn't your church attendance. It isn't even your church membership. Many people depend upon that for their acknowledgement that they're a Christian. It isn't dietary reforms, they're good. It's good to eat carrots and bananas. It isn't your dress reform, it's good to dress respectfully, modestly, in a proper fashion, but that's not your religion, and it's not your homeschooling. Homeschooling is essential for a lot of people today because they cannot find a place that's safe for their children to be educated in. They can't have security for the beliefs that they've given to their children in the school systems today, and that's the Christian school systems as well as the public school systems. 
The gospel isn't about living in the country. I live in the country, but that's not the gospel. It's just an aid to my Christian experience, nor is it your understanding of the truth, or is it your giving of Bible studies or the knowledge of prophecy and the last day events. My first Bible study that was given was Daniel 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the, all the world events. That's beautiful. It opened my heart. But in baseball, that's like making it to first base, but it isn't home plate. So don't merely depend upon that for your Christianity, for your religiosity, because that's only part of, it isn't the full picture. Neither is it our faithfulness in giving of our tithes and offerings. I tithe on a regular basis. I give offerings on a regular basis, but that is not what makes me a Christian nor it is, is it our defense of truth and the pointing out of error. I believe in that. Uh, in fact, if you're part of the same religious group that I am, you believe in the three angels' messages. And my religious affiliation believes that that is the message for the last days. But they missed the first angel's experience. And the first angel's experience is a demonstration that your life is hid with Christ in God. Then from that living experience in your life, your marriage, your family, your church, those you associate with at work in your neighborhood, then you proclaim the blessed truths that God has given us. And your life gets testimony to the truths that you proclaim. And that's the second angel's message. And the third angel's message then is a, pro is a warning of what's coming on this earth. And it's happening even as we talk right now. The devil is initiating the end times. But the proclamation and the warning must have a living demonstration. And that is what we have missed. All of these are good, but usually they become a substitute for the indwelling Christ, which only and can only bring oneness with God. There's two Bible texts I want to share that, that challenges us challenged me when I first read them. The first one is Romans 1.18. God's wrath is revealed against those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. When I first started studying the Bible, I fell in love with the truth. And I held those blessed truths, 28 beautiful blessed truths that may be very distinct from others, but I still treated my wife in an improper fashion. I wasn't raising up a godly generation. I had division and strife in my church with those who didn't agree with me. Something was missing. It was good, but it was something was missing. What about you? What about Romans 2, verse 23? You who make your boast in the law, and I did. I have the truth. I have the right denomination. I have the right lifestyle. You who make the boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Maybe not out in public. We have enough self-control for that, but behind closed doors, in the manner in which you treat your spouse, your children, at church with those who disagree with you. Who are you in those situations? That's the real question. Do you have a living demonstration that you abide in the vine in John 15 and that you have oneness with God in John 17, like Jesus had with his father. Here's quite a quote from the uh, second greatest book I believe ever written next to the Bible, Desire of Ages, page 310. Many men may profess faith in the truth. I did at one time, still do. But if it does not make them, listen up now, if that truth you believe does not make you sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavily minded. It's quite a list, isn't it? I fell short in that list. It is a curse to its possessors and through their influence, through people seeing you, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you drink, your deportment, the way you treat your spouse or don't treat your spouse, the type of children you raise up, how you treat those you disagree with, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. Oh, I'm glad I didn't say that, that I'm only quoting it. Powerful. Oh, my. 
write those down. Look at them. See how you line up with the situation. See what God is saying to you right now. These are very, very serious statements. Most of us have become so married to our truths, our doctrines, our Christian cultures, our forms, and our uh, denominations of the church that we go to, that we do not know how to walk with God hand in hand. Like Enoch of all dead, Enoch had a living experience with God. Enoch lived out this Bible verse in Colossians 1.18, that in all things, notice that word all, it's pretty descriptive, he might have the preeminence. What? That was Jesus' life, not just Enoch, that in all things, God, through Jesus Christ and his word, his spirit, has the preeminence. Preeminence means first. He's first. He's first in your marriage. He's first in your family. He's the priority of your day. You're always asking yourself, Acts 9, 6, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Wow. That's a real living Christian. You're filtering everything, not through yourself, not through your mere knowledge, but you're filtering it through God who speaks to your conscience according to his word and his spirit. That's preeminence. He's first in our families with our children. They have precedent over our businesses. They have precedence over our church positions. They have precedence over our our sports, over our news, over our uh, internet. They come first, they're a priority. Do people see that in your life? If they don't, it's Jesus and something else. Because Jesus always takes you to the first work. And then, then to the second work. That's Jesus. Jesus is first, last, and best in everything. I was out hiking with a Mennonite pastor. He wanted me to become a member of his denomination, which is a compliment. He really likes Sally and I. We got to know him because one of our neighbors in the country is a Mennonite. And uh, he was trying to set me up to, to see if I would line up with their lifestyle standards and their thinking. And I looked at him and I said, you know, pastor, let me ask you a question. And I just want you to answer true or false. And I said, all of Christianity is totally valueless unless I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Ay, 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 did that cut through all the rhetoric? So it cut through, yes, we should have right doctrine. Yes, we should believe in the truth. Yes, we should eat our carrots and bananas. Yes, we should dress properly. But all that is secondary to our living experience in and through Jesus Christ, John 15. Abide in me and I in you as a branch can do nothing of itself except it abides in the vine. That's what we're talking about. For example, we all have vehicles. I have a, a Toyota 4Runner, an SUV. My wife has a, a Mustang. And maybe some of you have a, a van or a pickup or a luxury car, whatever it may be. But what good is all that machinery without the engine? I <laughs> may say, Jim, that's a stupid question. Of course it has an engine. Well, what if you went in and took that engine out of my SUV and I jumped into it, it's got nice tin and I get in there, it's got leather seats and it's got a nice CD player and I go to have it take me someplace, no power, no power. Welcome to the church of today. We've got all the machinery. Machinery is our doctrines, it's our reforms, it's our denominational membership, whatever you put in there. But the engine is Jesus. He's the power to take you someplace. <laughs> and if you're, you're priding yourself in all the machinery, but you don't have the engine, it's useless. It amounts to no saving good. It can't take you any place. But we need both. We need the power source, the engine, and we need the machinery, don't we? but we're deficient today. 
we have disconnected the machinery from the engine. And I find that in all denominations today. I find that in independent ministries today. I find that in home churches I go today. I find that in self-supporting churches as well, or groups. They pride themselves in the machinery that they have, whatever you want to consider that to be, but they're lacking the power, the engine, Christ in you. It's first and foremost, you can't do away without it. When you disconnect that machinery from the engine, it can't take any place. You're stalled. Welcome to the church in our century. It is stalled, taking us no place. That's why we have so many problems in our country, the United States. That's why Canada's fallen under dictatorship today. That's why you see what's going on in Ukraine, China, Russia. We're stalled. The Christians are stalled. No power. And so we have no power to influence the world. And I find that it's Christians are at fault in it because we, we haven't been able to present to the world true Christianity. We're remaining, if I use a baseball analogy, we're on first or second base without getting people to home play, no home runs. We do not throw out the machinery. We learn how to connect the engine to the machinery. The Jews, God's first denominated church, they possessed the scriptures. They possessed reforms. They possessed dress reforms, dietary reforms, all kinds of rules and regulations, over 600 of them if you ever read them, but they did not possess Christ, or should I say Christ did not possess them. Their knowledge of the scriptures became a substitute for God himself. That is idolatry. When your knowledge and your reforms are a substitute for abiding in oneness with God, then they become idolatry. Is there Bible verses? Is what I'm saying scriptural? John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. That was Jesus looking at his denominated church, says you find your safety in the knowledge and reforms, but you won't abide in me. You won't find oneness through me, not through your church, not through your knowledge, not through your reforms, but through me. That was Jesus talking to his denominated church. He was saying you have the machinery, you have the truth, you have the doctrines, you have the reforms, you are even involved in evangelisms. But if you don't have me, you don't have life. Is that biblical? John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. His life in me is the light that I bring to the world. It's not merely the church I belong to. It's not just me quoting scripture. It's not just me eating my carrots and bananas. All that's good but it's secondary, it's peripheral to the core. The life is not your knowledge. It's Christ living in and through you and your knowledge guides you through it. We don't disperse with the knowledge. We don't disperse with the reforms. We must put the engine in the right place or the machinery does us no saving good. Jesus Christ is that power to live out the life that the scriptures point us to. The Jews tried to live the life without a, without a vital connection to the power, Jesus Christ. And look where they ended up. It all amounted to no saving good. Give me a good example, you say, Jim, of the God's first denominated church. The God's first denominated church trusted so much in their knowledge of truth and their... And their um, legalistic reforms that after they had nailed Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life to the cross, that they went to Pilate and they said, give us permission to take this man off the cross so that we do not violate our Sabbath. Did you catch that? 
their Sabbath actually became idolatry. And they were more concerned about legalistically violating the Sabbath that they crucified the Lord of the Sabbath. Is that hitting home with you? What is God's spirit saying to you right now? Are you lacking the power, the engine? The power we not deny is the heart of Christianity. And so the formula, the, the wrong formula, is knowledge and form versus abiding and oneness with God. And they should all be one package. They shouldn't be separate. But if you go in the churches, you'll see that they have knowledge and they have the form, but they lack the abiding and the oneness, and it's supposed to be one complete package, the machinery with the engine. You may have something. You may have found some truths like I did. You may have found some reforms like I did. Praise God for that. I still have a great healthy life today because of that. You may have been involved in outreach, touching other people's life like I still believe in doing, and I did them. You may believe that you belong to the remnant church. However, if you do not have Jesus living in and through you, you do not have life. That's absolutely sin. It's like oxygen. You can't stop breathing. It's absolutely essential to your physical well-being. That's Jesus. He's our oxygen. He's the one that empowers us. When I go in churches today, regardless of the church, regardless of whether it's a liberal, progressive, or uh, conservative church, the marriages are in coexistent mode. Seriously. The husbands and wives are not in love. It's obvious just for me watching them, what's not happening. When I look at our youth, I'm appalled. I was invited as a speaker at one of our Christian universities, the church that I'm a member of. And I went down to the cafeteria and I just stood in line. And I watched all the students coming through. And then I went to a public university that has no religion. And I watched in the cafeteria all the students coming through. I could not tell the difference. Oh, maybe in the Christian one, maybe a small percentage of them maybe with them, but with the masses, the majority, I couldn't tell the difference. What's going on? Mere knowledge and reforms do not make you Christian. And that's all that university was bringing to those students. We're losing our sons and our daughters. When I look in the church today and I see the behavior of what's going on in the church with our children sitting there with their their iPhones, and during the sermon, and they're texting each other back and forth, and they're looking things up, and they're misbehaving, and the noise that goes on, I'm going, to, where's the worship of God today? Where's the respect for a holy God? I'm not interested in that church. No power, just form. Our churches are lukewarm. We were out eating with a pastor and, and his wife having lunch with them. And I was impressed. I looked at the wife and I said, if your husband was no longer the pastor of this church, would you continue to attend this church? And the pastor looking at her, he's looking at me and he's wondering, what is she, what is she going to say? And she looked at me and she said, no. And his jaw dropped. And I said, why? She says, because of the indifference of the people in my own church. Indifference. That's the lukewarmness that God said, I'll spit you out of my mouth because you're not cold or hot. That's the church of Laodicea. It's the last church spoken of in Revelation by Jesus Christ. It's indifferent. It has need of nothing. And when you go into it, you can sense that. You can see it. True religion means living the word in your practical daily life. That's what I had to find. That's why I moved to the country of the wilderness to find a living experience. Your, possess, your profession 
is not of any value without the practical doing of the word. Can you imagine? A lot of people today are overweight. And let's say you go to a dieting class, all right? And the instructor stands up and he's 275 pounds. You're going to take instructions from him? Come on. Maybe we ought to practice what we preach. So here's my father. His family physician, Dr. Bell, tells him he has to quit smoking. He has lung cancer, emphysema. My father came home. When he walks in the back door, he is mad. He is upset. I said, Dad, what's the matter? And he, he takes his pack of Lucky Strikes out of his pocket. He crunches it up, and he throws it in the sink. He says, who does Dr. Bill think he is? When he told me I had to quit smoking, that it was a matter of life and death, he said, "What Dr. Bill bent over, I could see between his white lab coat and his, his, in his pocket, he says, I saw a pack of uh, cam camel cigarettes. He says, that hypocrite. He doesn't practice what he preaches. Who does he think he is? My father was mad because if we stand for something, we need to live it. Are we living it? Honestly, check yourself by this statement because I think, I think we are guilty of criminal neglect. I think all the churches of Christianity today, all the denominations are guilty of criminal neglect. Ezekiel 34 verse four, the weak have you not strengthened? Now check yourself by this. Don't check whether your church has. Have you? Have you strengthened the weak? You personally? Are you working with somebody that's weaker? Neither have you healed that which was sick. Are you? Are you healing those people around you that are spiritually sick? Are you having an influence on them? What about your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your employees, your employees? people that you work with. Now they have you bound up that which was broken. I'm working with people every week that are broken from their past, in their present, and they want a solution. You don't just bring them to church. You sit down with them and you introduce them to the Jesus Christ that's in you and how he saved you and how you filter everything through him. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. We have driven so many people away from our own church. In my denomination, the ex-members outnumber the present members. In other words, the people that we have driven from the church, that we have wounded, outnumber the ones that are attending. Shame on us. Do we know how to love without an F? Do we know how to wrap ourselves around these people and not bring them back to our denomination, but bring them back into the fold of Jesus Christ? If Christ is in you, you do, because you're getting your instructions from him. He knows what you need to say and do to them. Your church doesn't. Christ does. And if you're connected to Jesus Christ, in oneness with Christ, as Christ was in oneness with his Father, then you have the power. Then your conscience is so sensitive, the still small voice of God, that the lightest whisper of Jesus gives you the solution for these broken people that we have driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. The people in the church are lost today, not just in the nations, not just in the countries. That's why the United States has no power today, because the Christians themselves are lost. Oh, yes, they have mental assent to truth. They have some reforms, but they're not, they don't have that abiding in oneness in John 15 and 17. If you were to grade each member by this text and this text alone, 95% of the members would fail. That's my opinion. That's serious. Very serious. So what about if we bring it closer to home? If our own families, we have not found how to live the gospel. Me, behind closed doors. What then do I have to share with my neighbors 
if it doesn't work for me with my wife. If at age 73, if Sally and I are not in love, we have no power. But we're in love today. <laughs> I mean, we're in love today. We've been married 50 years, March 25th this year. 50 years, and we're in love. We don't just say, I love you. We don't just coexist. But the power of God living in her and in living in me brings us to the love source. We're more in love now than when we were courting when we were in college. What then do you share with your neighbors? Nothing but churchianity. And churchianity isn't going to fix it. Merely intellectual knowledge that does not save. Seriously, now, if we cannot get along with our spouse, if fighting and bickering is the routine in your marriage, what do you have to share with others that will change them? We were married counseling with a couple that we've known a long time. They're in their 50s. And um, wasn't able to convince them to filter everything in their marriage through Jesus Christ. So then the Lord impressed me to say, if you don't fix this marriage and bring Christ as the center core of it, you're going to lose your daughter who's in college and going to a Christian college. I said, there's more at stake than just your happiness. Your children are watching you. So the mother, the wife, talked to me next week. She says, you know, after you said that, it really woke me up. So I, I asked my daughter uh, what she thought. And her daughter said, mother, I'm never going to get married because I never have met a happy marriage or seen a happy marriage in my entire life. And she's only gone to Christian schools. And she's in a Christian college now. And she says, I've never seen a happy marriage in my life. They're all fronts and frauds. We wonder why we're losing our youth today, because they don't see it in us. All they see is mental ascent and reforms. No abiding, no oneness. We were working with a married couple, lovely couple, very dynamic, very outgoing. And uh, the man was telling me, he says, you know, Jim, we're giving 12 Bible studies presently, 12 different couples we go to, we give Bible studies. And I said, well, praise God. I wish everybody in the church, you could see he was feeling pretty good about it. And I said, can I ask you a question? He says, go ahead, Jim. I says, well, how do you treat your wife behind closed doors? And he looked at his wife and he looked at me. He says, not very good. And I said, so what are you giving to those 12 Bible studies? Jesus or something else? It was the or something else. The gospel, we're told in Romans 1.16, is the power of God living in and through us. And if the power of God is living in and through us, then we are in love. Then our children see it and they want what we have. When we go to church, other members want it. Our neighbors want it. We don't have to push it on them. We have some that they want and they desire and they're missing because there's peace, there's joy, there's rest. There's power over the fallen human nature. This couple only had a mental scent to truth and was selling people in the mental scent to truth. That's good. I don't have a problem with it. But it's empty in baseball, it's first or second base. No home plate, no home run. We need to start asking ourselves some very, very serious questions. What do I have to share with others that is going to really change them? Honestly, that's going to change them, not just mentally, but experientially, practically, every day of their life. If my children don't obey, if they argue and fight continually, if they don't know how to surrender their wills, if they don't know how to go to Jesus and subdue their, their emotions and their feelings, then does my religion have any saving value to it? We had gotten a phone call living up in the wilderness from an international religious speaker and author. She wanted to come to our house because her daughter 
wanted some help in raising her her child. So they came, they were staying in our guest cabin, they were over in the home. So we've got the international speaker, her daughter, and her son. And the son started really misbehaving in our living room. And the daughter looks to her mother and says, help. Now remember this teacher, the message she gives is what must I do to be saved? That's her message. And I'm not downing that. There's a lot of truth in it, but no practical application. And the grandmother, the religious teacher, looks at Sally and I and says, I don't know what to do. Help me. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Just mental sent the truth. Good. She wasn't teaching error, but it was lacking something. It was lacking the power connection to Jesus Christ to say, Lord, what would thou have me to do with my grandchild right now? And that's Acts 9, 6. Jesus has the wisdom. He will impart it to us just as the Father imparted his wisdom to Jesus when he walked on earth. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. Jesus was always dependent upon his Father for the wisdom and the power to carry out his life. That is to be us. That's why he's called the vine and we're the branch. We're always to receive the sap. That's the power to live the life. Otherwise we become brittle, don't we? Is that you? Well, that child, my wife worked with the child. I talked with the grandmother and the mother in about 20, 25 minutes. The child was surrendered. He surrendered his little will. He understood that his feelings and emotions didn't have to control him, that he could give it to Jesus and he could blow it away. It was beautiful. I wish you could have been. So I asked you, what did that religious leader have? She had something else. Listen to this very, very powerful quote, Desire of Ages, page 309 and 310. And again, that is my second most favorite book next to the Bible. I mean, I have read this book so many times, but listen to this quote. It is powerful. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. That just a mere assent to the truth is a deception if you think that's your righteousness. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. That was the case with the religious leader that was at my house. She had a, 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 a theoretical knowledge, and it was correct, but it was insufficient to bring her grandchild into surrender. The quote goes on. Many take it for granted that they are Christians. That's the churches today. When I go in the churches today, everybody believes they are a Christian simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets, but they have not brought the truth in the practical life. That means it works. It works behind closed doors. It works in your marriage. It works in your family. It works in your neighborhood. It works in your church with those who don't think the same way you do. It works because it has power. Men may profess faith in the truth, and many people do. I don't discount that. That's good, but that's only first base. But if it does not make them sincere, kind, now we're talking about the fruit, okay? We're trying to find out if you got the power, not just the knowledge. But if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavily minded, it is a curse to its possessors, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. That's who Jim Holmberger used to be. That's why I went to the wilderness. I was mentally converted. I was lifestyle converted. I was evangelism converted, but I didn't have the connection with Jesus Christ. And I didn't have oneness with my God. And I had to find that and add it to what we just discussed. The machinery without the engine is of no 
value. Perhaps we need to stop exporting and start importing. Ask yourself that question. What does this mean to import Jesus? It means no more Jim Hohenberger. That's what it means. I'm not in charge anymore. I and Christ are one and he is the one. I filter everything through him every day, all day long. My will, my way ceases to be an option. I now consult with Jesus on everything. That's why Acts 9, 6 is one of my favorite Bible verses. Lord, what would thou have me to do in this situation? And that's why Jesus lived that out. Jesus said, I can't of my own self do nothing. And that is to be Jim Hornberger, and that is to be you. All that is required on my part is a complete surrender of all my thoughts, all my purposes, my will, all that I have and all that I am to be used as he may direct continually. That's the true Christian experience. Is that you? This is true Christianity. Everything else outside of that is mere ordinary religion. What is the difference between the two? In the morning, I make a covenant with God that I am there to serve God and make others a priority in my life. So I come out of my study. I walk through my day. In the afternoon, I come in. My wife is at the kitchen, and she's got all these potatoes that need to be scrubbed. That's generally her, her job is to prepare the food. I usually set the table and do the cleanup. That's the way we work. But this particular day, God says, Jim, I want you to scrub the potatoes. I don't like scrubbing the potatoes. My wife usually scrubs the potatoes. What do you mean? I've got to scrub the potatoes? I don't want to scrub the potatoes. So now there's a clash between Jim's will and God's will for Jim. How does my wife know that I love her? Because I sacrifice myself for her. That's the only way you can show love is through sacrifice. So now the gospel is at play right now. All my mental knowledge, all my lifestyle reforms, all my evangelism boils down to will I follow Christ in the moment. And he's speaking to my conscience, nothing out loud, just saying, Jim, scrub the potatoes. That's the gospel according to to scrubbing the potatoes. So what are you going to do? Do you love your spouse or do you love yourself more? That's what it boils down to. It's that simple. Small decision, but very important. Because if you don't scrub the potatoes at home, you're not a Christian in church. You're a front and a fraud. So I said, Lord, empower me to scrub the potatoes. The Lord whispered to me, Jim, you already got the power, now use it. <laughs> so I scrubbed the potatoes, stood next to my wife in the, by the sink. She was fixing it. She just looks at me. Thank you, dear. It's that simple. And she gave me a kiss, gave me a little smooch. And we're in love today. Why? Because I scrubbed the potatoes. What is God saying to you right now? It may not be potatoes, it may be something else. The Bible text for that is Isaiah 30, 21. And thine ear shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the left and you turn to the right. Matthew 20, 27. Whosoever will be chief among you shall be his servant. Wow. A true Christian is daily, hourly, surrendering all to the will of God in their everyday life. Matthew 13, 14. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure, hidden in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The gospel isn't just finding the field. I used to think because I found the Bible, the scriptures, I found 
good doctrinal truth. I found the good lifestyle that I was on home plate. But if you take this look at this, the treasure isn't just finding it, it's possessing it or letting it possess you. 95% of the people in the church have found the field, but they haven't gone home, sold everything to possess it or let it possess them. That's home plate. Where are you? The possession of the treasure is Jesus Christ in me and through me, not just what he did for me. All three have to be in the place to be a true Christian. Possessing the treasure is scrubbing the potatoes, not just knowing I should scrub the potatoes. All you knew, all of you that were listening knew I should scrub the potatoes. But do you? See the difference between knowing and doing, finding and possessing? Which one are you? The gospel is Christ in me and I in Christ. That's John 15 and John 17 that I've been talking about through this message. It is so much more than our doctrines, our church, and our lifestyles. It is all in with Christ. Are you all in with Christ? Noah, when he was called to build an ark in the desert, when it never rained, was all in with Christ. Can you imagine that? They had a tailgate party laughing at Moses. I know, excuse me, when he's out building the ark. They made fun of him, but he was all in for Christ. Daniel, when he was told that nobody could pray to their God, he was all in with Christ. He still went up. He could have hid in his closet, but he still went up where his window was, opened the window, and he prayed to his God. He was all in. All in. The three worthies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when the king looks at him and says, either bow down to my religious statue or we're throwing you into the burning furnace. They were all in. What about you? What about John the Baptist when he was called to rebuke the king for living with his brother's wife? It cost him his head. John the Baptist was all in for Christ. Are you all in for Christ? We are admonished in Luke chapter 14, 23, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. There's a condition. He gave all for you and he asked all in return. It is a willingness to let God have me every moment of every hour of every day, that he may be my head, he may be my counselor, he may be my guide, that he may be my empowerment. And that's about 5% of the Christians I know today. Yeah. So if you're all in for Christ, with Christ, then I now consult and filter everything through Jesus Christ. That's Acts 9, 6. That means when I lose something, I simply say, Lord, where is it? You know, impress my mind through my conscience that you may enlighten me and help me. That's why I'm a vegetarian. That's why I eat carrots and bananas. So my mind is sharp to hear the still small voice of God speaking to my conscience. That means when irritation rises, I filter everything through Jesus Christ. I change channels. I believe in James 1.19, let every man be swift to hear, still small voice of God, slow to speak. We filter our words before we speak them and slow to anger. That's the gospel. That means feelings, emotions, appetites, passions no longer control me because I have a power inside of me that enables me to live above all those. It's finding oneness with God and it is the pursuit of my life, and it is to be, be the pursuit of your life. And everything else besides that is vanity. So let me summarize. So all that is required on our part is a complete surrender of our thoughts, our purposes, our will, which is our choice. All that we have and are to God 
to be used as he directs us. This and this only is true Christianity. Finding this living experience in and through Jesus Christ is to be our primary focus and everything else is to be secondary. So let me wrap it all up in five questions to you. Here's the first question. Does your religious distinctiveness overshadow your oneness with God? That's 95% of Christians today. Doesn't matter what religion they are, Adventist, Baptist, Catholic, Mennonite, whatever. Their distinctiveness overshadows their oneness with God. Number two, do you have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof in your everyday life? Welcome to the church of Laodicea. They have the form, but they don't have the power. How sad. What about you? Number three, are you chasing any religious jackrabbits? I have friends that are chasing every side issue in Christianity today, and they make their religion their knowledge of every side issue. Nothing wrong with the side issues. We should know about them. But if you don't have oneness with God, all the side issues do no saving good. So make sure your oneness with God, your abiding experience is in place. Then the side issues are important, not before them. Number four, are you guilty of criminal neglect? You know, if God made a requirement, he hasn't. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. But if he made a requirement that no one could go into the heavenly kingdom unless they brought at least one person into a living, abiding experience and oneness with God, that they, they were the tool that God used, how many you think could go through the pearly gates? Are you guilty of criminal neglect? There's hurting people all around us, all over. I shared the text in Ezekiel earlier. Are you living out that text in your life? I am. I pray every day, Lord, let my life touch other people's lives. Use the talents and gifts you have given to me to improve your kingdom, to touch other people's lives. And number five, would you say you have forsaken all to follow Jesus Christ? What is God saying to you? I don't think the church has. That's why we're so powerless today. I pray that this message has touched your life and that it won't be Jesus and something else. That'll be Jesus and Jesus only. God bless you.